Now, from the studios of Into Tomorrow in Miami, this is ITTV. Last month, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a report on possible threats posed by UFOs, now known as Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, or UAP. The mission of the Genesis 2 project, known as G2P, is to investigate validated UAP recordings and question the implications on our national security. Here to talk with us about just that is former Los Alamos National Lab biophysicist, Dr. J.C. Van Velkenberg. Dr. J.C., welcome into tomorrow. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing very well today. It's a pleasure to have you. There's, of course, a whole lot of folks that I'm sure listening. And also, we invite you to visit intotomorrow.com. You can see the actual interview with Dr. JC. And we've got some video and some still pictures and some things to show you. Uh, skeptics, uh, of course, will look at it kind of as I did. One of them, it's like, oh, come on, that's a bird. Uh, I watched one of the videos even when you slowed it down. But then again, it still made me wonder. So this is one of the things we certainly want to talk about. But first, tell me about the, the general mission of the Genesis 2 project, if you would. Well, when we started the Genesis 2 project, it really was because people have been seeing unidentified or unidentifiable objects and having experiences like this throughout modern history. However, largely it's just been passed on by word of mouth you know and at that point you're really focused on the person who's telling the story and you're focused on their story there's no data there's no evidence that comes out of it they're just sharing their experience however documentation has really advanced you know almost all of us carry around a, a phone every day that phone has camera capabilities it has video capabilities and at that point people are starting to capture more and more UAP. And that really just means things that we cannot identify. They are unidentified. We don't know what they are and we cannot explain them. But it's really reached a critical threshold with the amount of documentation. And I, I think I remember reading in 2019, at that point they were saying there were 1.8 billion images being uploaded every single day. You know, so, so part of those are going to be recording things that people don't know what they are. And so at that point, now we actually have evidence. We have data. And once you have data, it can start to be scientifically assessed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we started the Genesis 2 project, because we wanted to take this data. We wanted to make sure that it was forensically valid data. And then we wanted to be able to pursue a scientific study of what are these things? Well, I'm wondering, Doctor, if uh, UFOs, unidentifiable, unidentified flying objects, uh, became unidentified aerial phenomena, is there really any difference in that? I mean, why the name change? Uh, the name change really came about, in my understanding, it really came about because the term UFO has been so solidified within the entertainment industry. Uh. And it's been so sensationalized. And so when you use the term UFO, the majority of people are going to think of little green aliens or the saucer that flies through the air. You know, it's it really had a and it got a negative connotation, a very fantastical um, conspiracy theory and the people who quote unquote, believed in UFOs. They were the crackpots of society. And it, it marginalized the study and it marginalized actually that these things are out there. They're just unidentified. That's all it is. And so because of that popular, um, that popular conception of the term UFO, then we really needed to make a shift in the terminology to something else in order to segue society into the shift, a paradigm shift in the thinking about what these things are. So it's no longer, you don't go into this and say, there's something here, we can't explain it, it must be an alien. No, it's, you have to go into it saying, what is it? And to do that, you use the scientific process. And of course, that makes sense to me. I've said all along, I think probably all of my lifetime, that we can't be uh, so, uh, I guess, uppity to think we're the only intelligent, with air quotes, uh, life in the universe. So I I'm wondering how that plays 
into your research and the kinds of work uh, that you guys are doing? Is it, is it a similar concern that there's got to be other life out there? Well, of course, the question comes about of, okay, so you have something and it's here. So that's established. This exists. We don't know what it is. So what is it? That's the next question. So once you, we can start with our, with our current um, limitations of technology and knowledge, you start with the base that you have, and then you start researching from that base. So what we can look at is we can look at, at properties such as acceleration. We can look at um, uh, directionality. So you have something that's going in a straight line and making an immediate 90 degree turn, which as far as we know, according to our current physics and our current um, technology, that's not possible. Um, so we can start looking at those kinds of things. However, you're asking a very important deeper question, which is who made these things? Where are they from? Why are they here? What is their purpose? We have no idea what that is. We don't even have a place to start wondering about that or researching it. What we're hoping is that we can do scientific study to find out what with what is within our capability to find out and to expand our knowledge and to learn. And at some point, we'll reach another critical threshold. Well, maybe we'll be able to start figuring out now that we know more about them, we can start we can start thinking about, well, what are they here for? Um, but that may be that may be longer down the line. True. And, and I can hear kind of my audience in my head saying, what are they here for? They seem to just show up in trailer parks uh, or, yeah. or are they are they here to to, uh, you know, abduct and probe people? I mean, but I think, as you said earlier, that seems to be more the entertainment side of things, the the, the bizarre, uh, you know, it, hard to believe because it is hard to believe kind of, of entertainment value, I'm guessing. Uh, so it certainly makes me wonder about how you guys are are able to analyze some of the recorded UAP to make those differing concerns from that entertainment uh, aspect of it? Well, the very, the very first part of our scientific investigation approach is really a digital forensic analysis. So when an image is obtained, and it, it is a UAP, you don't know what it is, and that's why it's a UAP. At that point, we don't just take the image and say, oh, great, it's a UAP, let's start researching this. Hmm. Like you said, it may be a bird, you know? Yeah. So, so what, we, what we have to do at that point is we do digital forensic analysis, and we have chosen to use Primo Forensics. Um, they are one of the nation's leading forensic digital forensic analysis teams, and they use um, standards, rules, and regulations that are used in in the U.S. court system for any evidence that is given to the courts. So what, what, ha what that involves is even the device that the picture was taken on. Say like the picture was taken on an iPhone, then they have to have that phone and they have to digitally assess that phone to make sure to get all of the GPS coordinates off of it, the timing, the settings of the camera itself, the aperture, because these are all things that can affect an image that actually comes out at the end. Uh -huh. So they do that first. The second thing they do is they look at the image itself, whether it be video, video or a still image, and they make sure that there's no digital signatures of any kind of manipulation. And manipulation, typically, we tend to think of as photoshopping, you yeah. know, adding something in or really making it. However, manipulation is also changing the light very subtly to bring something out. That's still manipulation. So these need to be shown to be fully raw data files. No one has touched them. They have not been manipulated at all. And then the other aspect of what they do is they look at to see, because remember I said they have to examine the device itself and to find all of its settings and features. Yeah. Because the thing is that we all know there are artifacts that are created by the technology itself, such as a lens flare from the sky. So not everything it, it could be a lens flare or it isn't. And we assess for that. That's part of what Primo Forensics does is they look to say, okay, this is not a lens flare. This is acting differently than a lens flare. Again, at the end of this, we come back with a digitally authenticated file at that point that we say, we don't know what this is. Let's look at it scientifically. 
And have you been able to arrive at any conclusions uh, when looking at some of these things, even so far? Um, I, and, and by conclusions, I'm not even sure if I know what I mean, but, but you know, have you been able to ascertain anything in particular about any of these UAP pictures and videos and that sort of thing? Well, with G2P, we have been in a four year, we've been on a four year journey of data collection. That's what we've been doing. And we literally have thousands of images. Mm -hmm. And we assess each of those first to see which ones are worth you know, um, pursuing. But then we do the digital forensic analysis. We make sure that this is a bona fide image, that this has validity. And then we start looking at it scientifically. Um, at that point, we, this is such a new field. And, you know, people are entering this physicist, technologist and looking at it. So there's no hard conclusions, because like you said, of course, the one thing everyone would love to know is why are they here? <laughs> you know, and there's no way we can get to that. So we're just barely starting to really look at this scientifically and to really figure out, like, what can this tell us? You know, because, for example, if we can figure out how looking at the way things are moving that is so different from the way that we know, that's stimulate, stimulating the scientific mind in all these different fields that we're working in. Um, you know, so if we see, if we see something that goes against, um, the, okay, let me back up. The main conclusions we're coming to at this point is we are seeing patterns. And what I mean by that is we are not getting one type of vehicle in these thousands of photographs and and videos this is not one vehicle we are seeing hundreds of vehicles and what that is suggesting to us is that this is not a prototype of some stealth bomber for example that's being tested in u.s airspace or by a foreign entity um one of my colleagues has pointed out that if if it is a um a new technology that's being tested by another country, they're very unlikely to be testing it over foreign soil yes. where it can be photographed or intercepted. You yeah. want to keep your stuff secret until it's done. The other thing to think about is that because we're seeing hundreds of different types of vehicles with different types of capabilities that are unexplainable, that is also not a prototype. When you have a, a physical prototype that you make and you need to test, you don't make hundreds. That's not cost effective. You only make one or two. And we're really seeing hundreds of different types. And then you start looking at the patterns of those different types. So for example, if you see a bird fly across the sky, there's no bird that tumbles. Birds don't tumble in flight. And so we see things that you could say, like um, a naysayer could say, oh, that's a bird. And then you look closer. You just have to keep looking closer. And you think, OK, well, that's tumbling in the air. And this is not the exact shape of a bird, you know, and small things like that. And then you have physicists go in and they look at markers of the land, you know, so like a mountaintop or or a jet. Um, you can look at the flight patterns of jets in that area at that point and figure out how far the distance was the jet was. Then you can estimate the size of the object that was near it. And at that point, by doing the, the math, you know this wasn't the size of a bird. This was the size of something quite large or the size of the aircraft that it was nearby. Gotcha. And of course, again, we invite our listeners to come to intotomorrow.com and see the video of some of these things that Dr. JC is talking about. I'm wondering, Doc, if, if you have also reached out to astronauts, uh, American or any astronauts for that matter, uh, to kind of also get their take, because you know, we hear occasionally that they see things that they can't explain either uh, while they're on the space station or something of that nature. Is, has that entered into your research? Not into G2P's research because those are being handled in-house, you know, by, by their agencies that they're working with. Gotcha. But um, yeah, some of them are speaking out, which is, I think that's great because they are, they are also reaffirming this is a daily occurrence. And these are reputable people, kind of like you said earlier, you know, this isn't happening in a trailer park or with a farmer. These are highly specialized people. These are experts in their field and they're saying they have experienced this, you know, so it's, it's bringing it, but that they're not 
they're, they're working in house, if they have any kind of images, of course, that image is going to be owned and it's going to be assessed by their agency, mm -hmm. you know, because it is that it's impacting them directly in that industry. So they're not going to share that outside of it, typically, yeah. um, you know, but then with with us, what we see it as is we see it as a very good thing, because it's adding to the credibility of the people out there. This isn't just a crackpot who's saying something. There's a lot of unexplained things again none of us know what they are gotcha and i guess the good thing about nasa is that unless it's uh, a national security issue of some sort images and videos are typically released um, i know we use them regularly as well and when we're doing this week in tech history about various things because nasa does make those things available to us so Maybe we can learn more along those lines as well. Uh, Dr. J.C. Van Velkenberg is a Ph.D. with the Genesis, the number two project. Dot com. And of course, we'll get our audience uh, there when they visit us at intotomorrow.com. We invite everyone to come see these pictures and videos, just some of them, that we've been able to obtain uh, to share. And continued good work with whatever you guys are doing and the, the efforts that you are making to help identify some of these unidentified aerial phenomena. We appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. We're back with more as Into Tomorrow continues. I'm Dave Graveline at intotomorrow.com. And back with more here on the Advanced Media Network.